Thank you. Awesome, folks. Welcome to the International Euphonium Summit Living History Series. I'm your host, Nicholas Hofter von Heide. Special guest today is none other than David Worden. Good morning, everyone. And good morning, Nicholas. Good morning. And thank you so much. We uh, we had a an amazing content uh, on the podcast uh, segment before this. So if you get a chance, find your favorite podcast outlet and find the link at www.internationaleuphoniumsummit.com slash David dash wording or possibly on his website as well. We'll find that uh, out soon enough. We had a, about 50 minutes of great uh pre-recorded on this uh, conversation about permanence of uh, what we are doing virtually and uh, digitally. And uh, for those uh, that are interested in that permanence ideation, uh, you can continue that conversation uh, with us as well. And we'd love to hear kind of your ideas. We threw some ideas out there um, and see what you have to think about. So, David Worden, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. So, with the first in series, let's uh, hit it and uh, start with you know your first memories of musical beginnings. <laughs> okay, um, it was interesting for me. I came from a family that really didn't have a lot of music going in the house. Um, wasn't one of those families that always had classical music playing on the rec record player or the radio. The only record player in the house my sister owned, and I got to use it occasionally when she wasn't around. And I had a few records I liked, but I tended to favor, this is in elementary school now before I played an instrument, I tended to favor the trumpet. And I still do like trumpet quite a lot. So that was the first instrument I wanted to play when fifth grade came around and that's when we started instruments in school. So my dad bought me a cornet, I think it was, not a trumpet probably, from a friend of his for $10. And I didn't know anything about it. Uh, the valves didn't move, so I used some three-in-one oil that we had around the house to get them going. But after two or three months of my band director being patient and trying to get it to work for me, notes just weren't coming out sometimes. And I don't know if that's because it was an old leaky cornet or if just my armature was not quite right for that size mouthpiece. But in any case, he switched me over to the baritone is what we called it back then. It was actually a small euphonium because it was all conical bore and so on. It wasn't actually the, the British style baritone. It's what we used in schools back then. The uh, bell curved forward, had three valves in the front of the horn. And I played it in his office and it worked much better for me. And of course I liked the sound so I said, yeah, let's let's do this. So he, he loaned the you know the school horn to me and I brought it home. My mom looked at it and said, David, why do you want to play that big thing? So because it was much larger than the, the cornet case that I had. But nonetheless, I did like it and I kept working on it. And I wasn't a kid who had to be forced into practicing. We had those practice cards. If anyone's ever grown up with those, we had to put your hours each day and uh -huh. time each day. And that was not a problem for me. Um, I always liked to practice. I listened to music on the radio and still listened to trumpet players that I liked. And back then, Bert Camfort was starting his, his round as uh, one of the top 40 artists. And he had a trumpet player who was quite a nice soloist. So I'd buy some of the sheet music at the local store. And I'd play out of that or just play it by ear from the recordings to try and learn the songs. And that was sort of my beginnings back in fifth and sixth grade of learning to play. I don't really play by ear, but learning to, to play what's in my head and to make it come out of the horn the way I just heard it on the recording. So in a way I was giving myself a lesson or letting that trumpet player give me a lesson. And that was probably a good beginning. Um, when I went into junior high school that we had the, didn't have the middle school concept yet back then. So junior high school started in seventh grade. I went there and it was fortunate for me that my band director had been a trombone euphonium player back in his college days. So he knew something about the instrument and he helped me a little bit to develop sound and some of the concepts he gave me some nice hard solos to play. 
in ninth grade, which was still junior high school back then, <clears throat> it was kind of a bad time for the family. Um, we were not a rich family anyway. And um, I never had private lessons, for example, the whole time I was growing up. So I had to rely on what was in school and I got good lessons in school. I was very lucky to grow up in Davenport, Iowa, where they had such things. But my father was dying that year and we moved in with my grandparents. And that was a different school system. In that school system, I had Clara Beck was her name at the time. Um, a wonderful lady band director and teacher and she had me play my first ever solo with a band. I did Trumpet Holiday and um, had a good time playing that. And she also taught me how to trickle tongue. The contest solo I had that year was um, Stars in a Velvety Sky by Herbert Clark, which had some triple tonguing in it. So that was great. I was introduced to multiple tonguing at a rather early age. Then the next year, my father died by that time and I moved um, back to Davenport and I went to a school where the band director there had been a trumpet player. So again, it was a brass player, which was good for me. Very tough guy, um, <laughs> gruff, very gruff personality, but he was a good teacher and I learned a lot from him. And finally about the middle of my junior year in high school, um, he said, well, and we had weekly lessons, which was a nice thing, but he said, I'm, I'm really kind of running out of things that I can teach you, but you always come up here on your study halls to practice. We get a special pass, which is maybe why my grades weren't quite as good as they could have been. But I went up and practiced whenever there was a study hall period, a free period. And he said, you're always practicing anyway, so you just go ahead and do that. So I did. And I, I worked through the Arben book, worked very hard on that. Again, I was not taking private lessons, as some people did. But I listened a lot to recordings. I listened to Harry James, and I listened to Tommy Dorsey and got two different sides of brass playing from those guys. And in Dorsey's case, I, I bought myself a trombone to try and learn that. And it was an old Selmer Bundy that had, it looked horrible. <laughs> so I ended up stripping the lacquer off of it and then it looked a little better. But anyway, I taught myself how to play it. And I had a record of I'm Getting Sentimental Over You, which was Tommy Dorsey's theme song, a pretty ballad. I didn't know at the time my record player turned slowly. It was about a half step lower than it should have been. So I learned the song in that key. Oh, man. <laughs> I can still play it very well in that key today. That's what sticks in my head. I have to work at it to play in the right key. Um, but I learned the song. And I used to go up in my practice time at school and, and work on that song. And I was trying to get the inflections that Tommy Dorsey did. All of his phrasing, all the little pauses and the little breaks and things like that. That was important and it was good training for me as well it was good to teach myself based on a master of the instrument um since again i wasn't studying with a master i was studying with a very good competent teacher but he wasn't a master of the trombone or euphonium and at some point poor mr mortarboy who was the teacher the, the the band room where i practiced was divided from his office only by a half a wall it wasn't all the way up to the ceiling uh-huh he said david for god's sake practice something else for a while <laughs> You'd heard enough of it over several days, I guess. But I was a, a pretty intense practicer in those times. And I I would take pieces that I enjoyed. We played the Italian in Algiers um, back in high school. And I I got the couple of the other parts that I borrowed from other people so I could play more of the melody than we had in the euphonium part because I just loved it so much. And anyway, that was through high school. Anyway, I had no... Um, uh, what you might call serious lessons, but I had good regular lessons. And that taught me the basics pretty well. I had a good understanding of rhythms, how rhythms fit together, and a good understanding of melody, um, partly from the teaching and partly from all the listening I did. I listened to those uh, players I mentioned and also vocals and try to play songs the way I heard a vocalist play them. And that's still, uh, to this day, I encourage people to do that. It's, it's marvelous training to find somebody who's good um, and listen to them. I remember a story, um, I think it was an Arnold Jacobs story, um, where he was teaching somebody, a trumpet player, at the time he was trying to play, I think it was Song of the Nightingale, perhaps. And if I remember the story correctly, um, he talked to the student and said, now you've heard um, Adolf Herseth, who was you know Arnold's colleague, of course, in the Chicago Symphony. You've heard Mr. Herseth play that several times, right? 
the kid said, yes, I have. He said, now I want you to think about how he played it and play it like him. And the kid played it. And they said, see, that was better. That's because he's better than you. So, which of course is how we learn, right? Uh, one of the ways we learn. Um, so anyway, that was my learning experience through high school was um, a variety of different things. The, the lessons I had playing in band and trying to make the parts just right, listening to the other players in band. We had quite a good trumpet player in uh, junior high school. So I, I listened to him play these solos and I tried to emulate him when I did the same music. So that was a good way to, to get where I got. Um, it was not until my, my junior or senior year in high school that I actually heard a real euphonium player in person. We had Harold Brash um, come as our guest artist. And I chose one of the solos he had played then for state contest, the Hungarian Melodies by Vincent Bach, and really tried to play it like he did. And, and that taught, even though I was playing a different instrument, I was still playing one of the American style instruments. It was a four valve at that point, but it was still the American style horn. I really tried to sound like he did and, and phrase like he did. And that taught me quite a lot about euphonium. But otherwise I was listening, well, we had, again, I have to praise the school system. We had some great guest artists. The next year we had Doc Severinsen. Oh man. As a guest artist. Yeah. Uh, in junior high school, we had Rafael Mendez. So I was hearing some people who were just masters of the instrument right there in the same room where I was not appreciating all that they did probably at that point because I, my capacity here was limited by my experience. But um, it was a very good foundation. So, so I, let, let's, I'm curious what, so your your mom bringing the baritone home, did you bring home the, did you bring home that cornet that your dad bought you? Yes, and that, I I think they probably sold it to somebody else at that point, I'm not sure. But that, that was gone from the house anyway at some point after that. What, what did your dad say uh, when you, when he saw the baritone for the first time? Oh, he had no complaints. He was, he was a very easygoing guy, and didn't, he didn't care as long as if I was happy, and you know, he was okay with it. And my mom actually, you know, she didn't mind it either because it did sound a little better probably than the cornet did <laughs> in my hands anyway. Right. Okay. So, uh, was your sister? Um, you said you have an older sister. Yes. Okay. What was her take? between listening to you uh, with the cornet for a couple months at home than to the baritone? I don't recall any comments because she is nine years older than I was. Okay. So around the time I was doing this, not too far into it anyway, when into my fifth and sixth grade years, I can't remember exactly when she moved away to get married. She married an Air Force guy who was stationed in Caribou, Maine. So oh, man, <laughs> that's was, cool. Yeah, that was. Um, so she wasn't around, and I got to use a record player for a while. That was kind of nice. Thing. That's really awesome. Okay, so going forward, do you remember your uh, parents at any of your uh, Christmas concerts or holiday concerts? Well, more, more specifically, the first solo feature you had with Trumpet Holiday. With uh, Holiday, uh, let's see. Yeah, Trumpet Holiday. Yes. Do you but, remember their kind of uh, takes with you playing the solo feature on that? Well, my parents were separated back then, and I was living with my grandparents on my father's side. So my mom was not at the concert. <laughs> um, it was also a different school system. It was oh, That's right. Know, far that's um, right. And uh, my father was either, I don't remember exactly when the concert fell versus his death, but he was either too sick to come because he was bedridden for most of that year, or he wasn't there. So he he was not able to hear it live. I did get a nice compliment from the superintendent of schools though. Um, we talked about what a huge sound I had. And I, I hadn't thought about that concept at all. I just, I played the instrument, you know, and I wanted it to sound nice, but I hadn't thought about bigness of sound as a concept. So, and, so and, I had to, take a, had to take his compliment versus any from my parents at that point. My mom though, earlier um, in those early, early years, when I practiced at home every day, practiced mostly my band parts at that point. Chief, well, my parents finally went to a band concert. And afterwards, she said to me, you know, when you play with everybody else, it starts to make sense. <laughs> now I see what you were practicing. So that was a revelation for her. And she was relieved, I guess, that it would sound like music at some point. 
that that's cool that coming from no seemingly musical experiences for your parents to have that revelation uh, revelation uh and the full picture and fullness that your music that you practiced at home um made it actual sense instead of a bunch of gibberish and and uh, notes that might come to fruition somehow uh, <laughs> that's really cool um so picking up the trombone your 11th grade year or 10th yeah grade? 11th how, how how is how is that when you started practicing that at home well, I can't remember from whom I learned that you could equate a fingering with a position. But something, possibly my band director showed me that part anyway. And once I learned the math, so to speak, behind that, actually learning the instrument wasn't too bad. Um, I, w I probably would shudder to hear a recording of myself from back then as far as intonation, you know, because um, the... One thing, the American horns, the, the euphoniums, the small euphoniums, I'll call them, or baritones, uh, were pretty good at was playing reasonably well in tune. You didn't have to work very hard to, to fit in with the band. It actually was harder when I got a Besson for the first time, when I got the big more compensating Besson. There were more quirky notes to deal with. The American horns are pretty good at that, so I probably played reasonably well in tune on the horn, on the euphonium, but I don't, I can't imagine that I did on the trombone. <laughs> But uh, anyway, no one at that point, nobody was complaining. My mom, I was living with her by then. Um, and my stepfather was not in any way, shape or form musical. Um, so he would never comment. He liked old country songs, you know, was, was his uh, genre, which I hadn't yet learned to love. Um, I do now love country music and a lot of it anyway, but I didn't then. So I didn't hear a lot from him and my mom really didn't say very much. Um, she would come to concerts and no, it sounded nice, but you know, she didn't understand all the intricacies, I don't think. I only learned through my sister, gosh, only about 10 or 15 years ago, that my father had been a singer on the radio back in Davenport. Oh, wow. I was, yeah, I had no idea that anybody in the family had any musical talent because I, like, they didn't own a record player for the family. They were never playing music on the on the radio. The only music that I heard in the house was whatever they played on television. And I had at some point a little transistor radio that I finally listened. Fifth or sixth grade, I got a little about that big at the time. You know, it was, it was a, a monumental success of technology. It was this tiny radio you could carry around and listen to AM radio stations. Um, so I listened to music on that. But yeah, apparently my dad did have some musical talent. And who knew? I didn't know. He never sang in the house that I heard. So I wish I could have heard it back when he was in good voice. Right. Wow. That would be really interesting to see if there's any of those recordings floating around somewhere. Well, I've gotten pretty good at scoping things out, finding yeah. stuff that hidden, you know, from, from anybody else, it seems. So sometimes I haven't found one of those yet. I'm not done trying, though, because occasionally somebody would record a radio show mm -hmm. for whatever reason. And so some of those end up on places like archive.org, um, places like that. And I've been trying, but uh, not yet. So if anybody happens to listen to the podcast segment before we started recording this and combining that information with what we were just talking about with uh, David's dad um, and uh, singing, if you by chance come across that recording, put a drop a link where you find it. If if that is available at the time of uh, of finding or uncovering that resource, that would be really <laughs> spectacular. Um, would love to hear it, yeah. Absolutely. Wow. Uh, getting through all the way to high school, when did you, I, I'm curious about going forward and stepping back as where we first launched Euphonium Summit and doing a more fuller length uh, recording. However, I think this would be a great segue into a post show. Uh, so going back into the podcast and um, having David Worden come back on and 
doing another segment with his next segment of life. Um, and I, it looks like I have an agreement right there with that nice smile. Absolutely. Yes. Outstanding. Uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, your childhood with us as you're about to leave for college for the first time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> man, <laughs> what a trip, right? Um, I, I love technology, how it's uh, put the put this ability before us and to share your childhood with those that, you know, have that hardship that they're going through as well, you know, growing through, um, you know, I, I don't know where the students are who are watching right now, uh, but I'm sure that there are those that can resonate with your childhood experiences and, and share the the indifference that a parent might have not necessarily not supportive but very supportive just not knowing how to support a musician uh student uh as far as you know what other services or opportunities that uh, you can provide as far as a parent and david actually brings up a great point with uh listening you know if you're a parent um, that you're in a rural area somewhere out in society somewhere and you don't have a record player but you have a cell phone there are so many great resources on uh, the podcast segments uh, like Spotify or Amazon music or or YouTube at the time of this recording uh, that you can pull from to have your uh, student uh, artist uh, learn from just hearing like David did growing up um, and for those that are uh, interested in learning from lessons I was actually uh, on David's website uh, about an hour ago or uh, well now more than an hour ago and he mentions some really amazing resources like going to your local church and possibly finding some free lessons by musicians there. Um, so I, I did see that on his website. Uh, so you can find that on internationallyphoniumsummit.com slash David Dash Worden. And you can scroll down uh, to access his website or go directly there, davidworden.com, D-A-V-I-D Worden, W-E-R-D-E-N.com. Uh, for more information and we appreciate your uh, patronage uh, to watch and listen to uh, these segments and David's beginnings as we uh, continue this another time and if you haven't listened to the podcast segment we're going to be going back over and doing a recap of this interview uh, segment and we'll be at the about one hour and 15 minute mark as my four-year-old uh, chimes in in the background there. Uh, it's awesome. Uh, kids are wonderful uh, a lot of times. Um, and he's about ready for lunch. <laughs> so uh, thankfully my mom's out there watching him. Uh, and oh, he's, uh, he's probably getting some noodles out for spaghetti. Uh, so... Until next time, everyone, David, thank you so much for joining us on this segment and uh, sharing your journey with uh, music and life. Thank you for reminding me and for listening to my long stories. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's a blast and look forward to having you on next time. Until next time, thanks, everyone. Thank you all. <laughs>